There are different, very different principles of growth in management, and I want to talk about what happens in the real world of the creation that God made, and that we need to know how to manage it correctly, to enhance the photosynthesis, which is our gift. All our energy comes from the sun. So we want to convert that into uh, something that we can uh, consume and a way to enhance the environment the fastest and the most. Uh, this is not only about profits. Uh, when I talk about profits, it means also uh, quality of life. It means uh, wildlife, everything that equates to biological capital. We want to live off the biological capital interest. So the more capital we can accumulate in our land, the higher the interest, not the rate, but the interest that we can take every year. If our land is going downhill, the less interest we can take every year. And if we don't reinvest, we will end up spending our capital. That means degraded environments. So we want to revert that and regenerate through our practices the land that has been mismanaged in the past. Maybe not by us, but it has been mismanaged. The potential of productivity on the land is huge, and we're just scratching the surface. We don't even, we don't even know how high it can be. But it can be very high, and it can be done without external inputs like chemical fertilizers or chemicals in any way. We don't use insecticides, herbicides, any ites that kill life, we, we don't use that. So we try to make nutrients available in the soil through microorganisms. Eleni Ingham just uh, wrote recently that we have enough nutrients in our soils, in every soil in the planet, for a billion years. We only have to make them available to plants through soil life. That's a pretty bold statement, and I didn't agree totally until like uh, eight months or a year ago. Now I know it can be done because in Florida we started with a very low productivity sandy soil that has a carrying exchange capacity of three to eight. That's the ability to hold moisture and nutrients. Organic matter less than 1% totally devoid of mycorrhizae. It was killed with glyphosate every two weeks because they had a tree nursery, the previous owners. So we need, needed to regenerate that. And of course, when we plant cover crops, we never use herbicides. We saw what herbicides did to the land. So we're not going to use it, even if it's very popular. So when we do cover crops, we manage different. This is how we started in April 2012. You can see the irrigation lines where they have the potted trees, and they came in big trucks to pick them up. There were uh, up to 55 gallon uh, pots with big trees to sell for housing development. So we had a lot of bare sand and some grass and a lot of dog fennel, which is toxic. Uh, so we started with uh, Machona cattle that we brought from Northern New Mexico. That's the same paddock three years and a half later. That's a stockpile bahia on, on that same paddock. We still have some dog fennel because we don't use herbicides, but now the forest production is so high that in this paddock we harvested over 250 cow days this past week per acre. So that's how you increase production, by increasing the number of plants per square yard and the ratio of leaf to stem by correct non-selective grazing. After three and a half years, we went from very poor land to that, to 640 animals on 500 acres total, um, distributed in that way. 200 acres of bahia grass, 150 of that bahia grass over seeded to a summer pasture crop, 30 acres to tropical legumes, and 120 acres of, of summer growing perennials, which is the bahia, and other uh, three species of grasses that have come in uh, to stockpile for winter use. We're trying to manage a whole. We, I see the, a, a farm as a living organism. The whole farm is a living organism. 
And now, uh, have, have you watched the, the movie Avatar? <coughs> How all the plants were interconnected. Uh, over there, they went into a spiritual way that all that, but uh, it's true that all plants are interconnected with mycorrhiza if you don't apply it. So if there, mycorrhiza is the largest organism in the world. It, it can cover up to 100 kilometers square, and that connects all the plants in between, and they can communicate and send elements that are needed. And it also solubilizes the phosphorus. The need for non-selective grazing. Under rotational selective grazing, the cattle will consume the best species and parts of species first. I'm going to go again through what we already knew because it's hard to believe and it's even harder to implement it. That's what I have seen. People walk away and they say, yes, I'm convinced. Then you come back a few months later, and no, they didn't do it. So then we, we have the less desirable species increasing, or the part that was left that this, this wasn't grazed down, that gets old, starts to oxidize, turns brown, and that inhibits the new tillers to come, from coming up. And if it's laid down, it will cover the growing points and shade them and kill them. And we end up with wider plant spacings. That's not noticeable the first year, but the second year it will. If you always graze tall and try to graze the top third. So severe non-selective grazing where all the plants are grazed or trampled severely in a short time leads to a more desirable species composition as it levels the playing field and every different species has to grow from zero or, or close to zero. What happens when you graze non-selective severely? What comes up? Leaves or stems? If you mow your yard, if you mow your yard really short, do you produce a lot of leaf or a lot of stems? Stems? Okay, I always think that it's leaf. That's why golf courses are mowed. Are you with me? Yeah, you need leaves for the solar panel. No. When, when you cut with a mower, what comes up? Leaf or stem? Well, you got a stem left after you mow it off. No, you mow uh, an inch short. Yes. So the same stem produces leaf? Yes. Yeah, probably throws up a leaf. My question is, does it grow leaf or stem? Oh, yeah, it grows yeah, leaf from the root reserve. I'm not talking about the root reserve. What grows, leaf or stem? Well, leaf. Leaf, right. Okay. Where does it come from? We'll talk about that later. With a high stock density, aeration will also occur from hoof impact. Okay? If we don't have a high stock density, there will be not con no concentrated hoof action, and we'll have uh, pads made by the cows because we leave them there a long time for them to finish the grass. And it all comes from the sun. The type of grazing will determine the following regrowth leaf to stem ratio. If you go out and throw a square yard made with a PVC, throw it in the grass, and you cut with scissors all the material, and you bring it to that table and you separate the leaf from the stems and you weigh it and you know what percentage of the total biomass is leaf and what percentage of the total biomass is stem. That's very important because what part of the plant does photosynthesis? The stem or the leaf? The leaf. What part of the plant does the, the respiration at, during the day? The stem or the leaf? The, the stem, the stem continuous respiration. So we have a situation, this is photosynthesis and this is respiration. So this is the net gain of the plant. This is a chart that didn't work, this works. This will be uh, energy. and this will be time. So photosynthesis creates energy, respiration consumes energy, but respiration is needed to survive, to live on and produce, okay? 
So what do we want for more energy being produced, more leaf or more stem? Leaves. More leaf. What part of the plant has a higher digestibility and energy content, the leaf or the stem? Leaf. Leaf, leaf is up to 65% digest digestible, and stem will be 35 to 40% digestible. So that's just to ex exemplify how important the type of grazing is. The more leaf we can produce, the more photosynthesis is done, which in, ter in turn creates more sugar exudates, which is liquid carbon, because sugar is a carbohydrate and it's made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. This is a sugar. So where does the carbon come from? Carbon dioxide. Where does the hydrogen come from? Water. Oxygen, water. So that's how the plants create carbohydrates. And that's how they capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and put it down into the root exudates as food for the microorganisms in the soil. And it's how we can revert the excess carbon dioxide out there in the atmosphere and put it into our soils to increase our real fertility of the soil, which is the humus content. Now, how do we create humus? Well, when we have enough solar panel, which is the leaf, the, the more leaf we can create per square yard, the bigger the solar panel. And that leaf is pumping liquid carbon, sugars, into the soil, feeding the bacteria and the microorganisms in the roots. And that is what increases the real fertility of the soil. The fastest we can do this, the faster the soil improves. That's why I showed first the results that we achieved in three and a half years. The stocking rate, the average stocking rate in that area is five to 10 acres per cow, the neighbors. And they feed hay for three to five months of the year. We don't feed hay and we have close to uh, one animal unit per acre. And it's only been three and a half years. But every year it improves to, at, at the rate that the cows are reproducing. And we have had an average of 90% fertility. So that's, that's awesome to me, <laughs> yeah. really. Carbon capture. Well, I already talked about, but one acre of well-managed pa pasture can capture up to 10 tons of carbon dioxide per year. So in these three and a half years, that's what we have captured. That's very important. Because if we can go from 1% organic matter to 4% organic matter, each percent of organic matter releases 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year, and each percent of organic matter holds 25,000 gallons of water. That means 100,000 gallons of water more, and 120 pounds more of nitrogen released every year, and that's what makes the production go up without inputs of ice. Every time we enhance photosynthesis through our management or any other way, even if we have to spray something like a liquid fish or molasses to make uh, in photosynthesis increase, and this can be measured by a Briggs reading in the lips, we are pumping more liquid carbon sugars into the soil, and that will increase the subsequent humus content of that uh, land. A any questions about this up to now? Yes. How did you re, did you inoculate that soil with anything? What, you, what was the first step you did? Back there. <clears throat> the first step we did was put cows in right. because cows have in their rumens all the microorganisms and the same ones that the soil needs. I think God did it that way because when you have a, a flood, a fire, an extended drought, those microorganisms die. And then cows and other ruminants being migratory came back 
and re-inoculated the soil with it. So the first thing we need is cows or any ruminant. Okay. Can be done with sheep also. Yes. I didn't know if you use like compost tea or oh, oh, I'll go there. We use compost extract, okay. but we didn't do it the first year. Until the first winter we started, but not that time. Did you use any liquid fish and seaweed? No. Uh, compost extract, we use like a one and a, and a half pounds of compost, good compost per acre, plus one gallon each of liquid fish and molasses. And that's it. Did you put that in the sprayer? Uh, on a sprayer, and I have pictures there. Yes. 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 So if you're trying to do this from scratch, um, and you know that your, your inputs are going to be high if you try and start out mob with, a, with that high of an animal per acre load. What do you do to achieve the same effect of either beat it down or eat it down? If you know, in other words, if I have 10 acres and I, and I buy 10 cows so that I have one animal unit per acre, what happens when I run out of grass? That's basically. Then I, I'm going to have to feed in the beginning. Am I? If you don't have any grass, you mean? No, I have some grass, but. Okay, like there. L look how much grass there was. But you had 500 acres. Yes, and 163 cows. I wouldn't start with more if you have that type of grass, very little and very sparse and a lot of sandy soil. Uh, don't don't do tempered. For, don't do one per acre at at first. Our goal is to go to two per acre, but not at first. It's gradually. So do you grade to get that effect? Do you graze them on a smaller area to, to, to force them? You see? You have to make your paddock smaller. So you see, each day a cow will uh, unload like uh, 50 pounds of manure and, uh, I don't know, 20 or 30 pounds of urine. That's your fertilizer. So you want to concentrate that as much as possible because if you, if you spread it out, there will be no effect. But if you concentrate it, there will be a large effect. So that's the first thing, to go to high stock densities. Even if you have five cows, you can do the same. On a smaller. On a smaller, like we're going to see later. They have a 72 uh, sheep that equals like uh, six cows. And they are doing, giving them a very small break so they eat it all and trample it. And they leave all the manure there. If we give them too large a break and leave them longer, they will not consume the grass because now it's fouled with their own manure. So it has to be very small and four times a day in, this win in winter. Yeah. Uh, next ones, please. So yes, you can start with very poor soil. So, in reality, the type of grazing, selective or non-selective, has a great influence and real implications on how fast the soil improves. I am riding on a forum of cattlemen here in the United States, and uh, many people say, no, no, there is no difference. All the different grazing systems are the same. While it's true that all, any grazing system is better than continuous grazing, not all are the same because selective rotational grazing will not improve the soil as fast as non-selective. And I'm going to explain why. This higher humus content allows for a greater drought resiliency, higher nutrient content of the grass or produce, better buffering against pH extremes or salt content in the soil or water, and will provide a nutrient storage facility for the roots. The humus will remain stable in the soil for up to 40 years. So it's not something that you create and it's washed away. If you continue improving and building it up, it will keep improving in production and resiliency. And then later you can be more creative, creative and rotate with vegetables, the cattle, or do some uh, cover crops. You can be more creative. But you have to create the fertility first. And the fastest way to do it is with livestock and correct grass management. That's how the most fertile soils in the world were created. Not in forest, it was in the plains. This is in the Chihuahua Desert in Chihuahua Mountains in Mexico. 
this ras with rotational selective grazing had not been touched. The cows came, but because they could select whatever they wanted, this grass is low quality and very hard. They didn't eat it. So this grass there was three years old, and they wouldn't eat it. So we did non-selective grazing when we, where we put them in small areas and moved them more frequently and gave them a protein supplement because it was low protein after three years growth. And this, that's how it looked in November 2015, that's year. Next one, please. I went there in July and took that picture. 26 days after the rain started. So go back, please. This is how it looked. Then that's how it looked after it started raining. This one is a high quality legume shop called uh, Gatoncillo. That's a very high quality, and here is another one. Next one. But you see a lot of leaves, not stems, is capturing sunlight, converted it into carbohydrates, and pumping it, a lot of it, like 40%, into the soil for microorganisms to be converted later into humus. And this is a, a cowboy hat, and there is a cowboy there, under it, <laughs> and on a horse. So that's very tall, right? <laughs> Next one, please. Then I went again in November and took the picture. Now it's dry again, but now the density is more, more plants per square yard. And there is a lot of new plants coming up. Because we do non-selective grazing, we don't have to come back faster. When you graze 80% of the grass, you can take longer to come back. And that allows seedlings to establish. When you take 10, 20, or 30 percent of the grass, which is not the top third. They graze some plants down to the ground and some they leave. Then you, you have to come back three times faster, and then the best plants haven't recovered, and they will get eaten again because they are more young, and then you create a very bad situation. That's my experience, yes. So you didn't reseed anything, that was all just plants that were there? All the seeds are in the seed bank, in the soil. We don't need to plant. But there is one species that we are introducing because it didn't grow there. You see this ecosystem didn't get the bison. It's full of rocks. You cannot walk or run because of the rocks, the volcanic rocks. So it was an ecosystem populated by big horn sheep big, huge herds, but they didn't migrate like bison did. A uh, key species of the tall grass prairies is uh, Andropogon gerardi, a big blue stem. So we are reintroducing it there and it's doing very good, great. Yeah, not with sheep, but with cattle. You see, uh, we cannot go back in time and, and have all the fauna, the mega fauna that we had. So we have to do with what we have, which is cows and sheep and goats. For example, a mastodon or a, an elephant or a hippo or a rhino or a zebra or a donkey, they are all hind gut fermenters. That means they can do well on higher fiber forages, lower in protein. They can do well. A donkey can be fat on 4% on old grass where a cow will be starving. So if we want to do the same job that multiple species did long time ago with only one or two, we need to adjust. In this case, supplement whenever the protein content of the grass goes below 8%. That's not the situation here. Here you have tall fescue, so that's different. Next one, please. That's the, the one I was talking about, the uh, gatoncillo. So now it has time to grow and go to flower. But if we only top grazed, in theory, and came back sooner, it will not be able to produce seed. And the seed will not have time to fall to the ground and sprout a new seedling that has enough root to not be pulled by the following grazing. Well, that's why in that erratic rainfall, low rainfall, it's a 18 to 20 inches, we go to an 18 month rest. It's just an example, not to do here, okay? Next one, please. We need electric fencing to allow for total control of our cattle. We need high voltage so they don't get out, sheep or cattle. 
And then we can achieve a non-selective grazing, adequate recovery periods, and non-growing forage reserve. What do I mean by a non-growing forage reserve? Let's say this is the farm in area, and we start grazing, let's say uh, we start grazing them non-selective in the spring. In the spring, the grass grows excessively fast. So we're not able to go through the whole farm before it goes to seed. To prevent that, what we do is we keep going like this, and whenever this first one is thinking of going to flower, that means the flag leaf is up, we go back there. So we might end up grazing only this in the spring. You get the idea, right? So all the rest you allow to grow without grazing, to keep quality up here. Then when growth stops in midsummer, then you can use some of this. Not all. Let's say you use the next third. Then when the, you get the, the fall growth again, and less, but you get some growth. This starts to regrow, and you still have this left for winter. Every year we alternate these areas, so it's not the same area, because when you allow grass to grow tall, every year in the same area, you kill the growing po points through the shading of the tall st stuff. So we don't want to kill the growing points, but we want to keep quality up, so by doing alternating this, we do that. If we always did, if we had enough animals to graze it short the whole farm in the spring uh, growth, then we wouldn't have enough grass for summer and winter. So we need to divide it in thirds in this environment. A dry environment, half. But in this environment, more or less thirds. Yes? Is this bottom portion then at the end of the winter? This will be a spring. What's the status of that at the end of the This will be summer. This is not set in stone, okay? You can go back if it's growth and offer. Every year will be different. And this will be winter. And fall can be around here. This at the end of the winter, like, let's say right now, we go there and we see this. This, because this year was warm, winter was warm and it rained, this has regrowth. But ideally, you wouldn't have to go there. And you will leave that to grow. So in spring, when you need it, taller forage, so they don't get uh, loose manure, you go here. Because then they will be eating some brown or some other uh, grass along with the new growth, and that will uh, equalize the room and better. But that was your spring last year. Yes, let's put the year here, 2015, okay? She's asking what will happen at the end of the winter mm -hmm. with so, this. So now we're talking uh, March 2016. Back to that spring plot. No, no, where do you go? Okay, you go here. After you graze it down, this will have a lot of root reserves because it was growing through the whole growing season without grazing. So when you graze it down, it will spring up like crazy in the spring. And that's where you go. So you'll regraze that, start yes. over. Yes. Okay. And you don't graze this, ideally. Okay. Ideally, you have some of this left by springtime in this type of environment. In Florida, it's different. Non-selective grazing is essential for the health of our pastures. When we allow selective grazing, we are favoring the less desirable ones because they will not graze those when we allow the animal to do what he wants. And they can, with time, dominate the pasture. For example, if you want to have a 100% fescue-dominated pasture, just let the animals graze selectively and move them fast. You will end with 90% or more fescue. If you don't want that, because fescue can be toxic in the summer, 
you need to do some type of severe grazing. So more leaves are produced which are lower in the endophyte and less seed heads are produced which are very high in the endophyte. It's as simple as that. Can you sort of repeat that? What yes. Tall fescue is notorious for being toxic by an endophyte, a fun fungus that infects the, the plant and gives it heat resistance. But to the animal, it's very toxic. That endophyte is concentrated on the seed heads and it's very low in the, in the leaves. So because leaves produce the photosynthesis, we want a lot of leaf, in, especially in tall fescue. So if you graze selectively where they take the leaf off and leave the stems, you are creating a problem and by midsummer you will have a wreck. That's what I have seen in Missouri and other places. I have so much fescue. Well, you can change the composition of your pasture by changing your gra grazing management. As I suppose first, what will the animal graze if you allow him to do whatever he wants? The, the best ones or the worst ones? Well, in summer, fescue is toxic because of endophyte. So they will not touch it. So that's why it becomes a fescue-dominated pasture. But if you do this, and you take it down in the winter, down, like mowing, then it will produce a lot of leaf in the spring. And then you can graze it without problem. It will not be a problem. And then you stockpile another area full of fescue, and in winter, there is no heat stress. So the animals will do well. And fescue after frost will go up in sugar content. So in, in the winter, fescue is very desirable. Summer, fescue stems and seed heads are very bad. So we want to manage that. After non-selective grazing, the species with wider leaves will display the less desirable ones. Why is that? The best species have wider leaves. That means they have more energy. Why would they grow faster than the narrow leaf Species. Bigger solar panel. Bigger solar panel, exactly. That's why. So when we graze non-selectively, they will displace the less desirable species. When we graze selectively, it will be the other way around. They will be diminished. Because cows need to come back faster, and they will go again to the highest energy forage, which is the most desirable one, and kill it eventually. That's why grazing management is so important. As fertility increases, humus or organic matter, under this management, the best species increase because they require better nutrition where they will dominate the less desirable ones. And then you will see that happening in the lower spots first. And then as fertility increases in the whole form, which is one organism, they will start to go up into the higher places. Why is that? Because humus, uh, holds a lot of water. As humus content goes up, they can go to where previously it was dry. Now it's not dry anymore. Uh, another reason why we do non-selective grazing, the highly desirable species return when we defer part of the farm for the whole growing season, alternating with severe non-selective, because then they have the time to sprout and establish roots. Whereas before, when they had to come back in one or two or three months, they were pulled out by the roots, with the roots. Longer recovery periods due to better harvest efficiency. Let's say if you have one acre and you only harvest a third of the available forage, that means you have to come back three times faster than if you harvested all of it. If you had a, an acre of corn, will you graze, will you harvest only a third and leave two thirds laying down? No. We've been told that it's very important to trample most of the material, even graze 10% only, and trample 90%, because that will improve the soil the fastest. And I maintain that the way to improve the soil the fastest is by having more leaf to stem ratio. And that will pump 
liquid carbon sugar into the soil and enhance the soil microorganisms to where they will improve the soil the fastest when they are decomposed into humus. That's my observation and my experience. I've done this three ranches now in, in my lifetime. I didn't know this before. Uh, every time it's faster because you learn more. Two in Mexico and the one in Florida now. And we're doing the one in Chihuahua. And, and the improvement is very fast. You notice immediately, very, very fast. So that leads us to a higher sustainable stocking rate per ranch. And that's what gives us the profits.